We're going to start the installation with the engine going on to the airframe. Grab the engine mount, have it powder coated if you'd like, <clears throat> and then maybe ream out some of the holes or have them plug the holes prior to powder coating. And then install it onto your airframe. The hard part, if there is such a thing, is the bottom two bolts. There's very little clearance inside. You have choices. You can drop down the little channel underneath the airplane and make the front screw in there like flush. That'll give you a little more room for the nut that goes in there. We also supply some undersized MS nuts that you can use to make that feasible. You might have to grind a wrench to make that work. The top left and right or the middle as far as the height it's just easy you just put them through make sure you have adequate a number of washers if you need to get a proper clamping the top is standard same as with the any other engine uh, 2-5 size bolts and make sure they line up with the cage inside before you drill the cage needs to be centered on the firewall so that the whole airplane is not crooked Leave everything loose and mark it that it is loose, all the bolts, while you install the engine in order to make it easier for installation of the hardware. The engine uses two rubber dampers, one front, one aft, at each location. If need be, uh, you would space it. On this engine mount, we space it just slightly forward to get the zero to one degree down thrust. Use a large fender washer front and back, and then a smaller AN washer, dash six front and back, and also additional washers if you need to take up any length of the bolt. Torque down until you feel the bottom, the, the bolt bottoming out against the steel sleeve that you have inside of these rubber dampers. So the assembly should look like this when you're done. And that includes or completes the installation of the engine to the airframe. Last thing to check is that the engine is level or slightly down in the nose. And the reference point for that using a digital level on the Zenit airplane is the top of the aft cabin fan. So you can lay your level up here. Make sure you miss the rivets. Zero it. Bring it forward and place it on a level surface on the engine. Level surface could be a machine surface, such as the top of this radiator housing or on top of the gearbox. It can also be 90 degrees to that in front of the gearbox if you'd like. Once the engine's hanging on your airplane, and by the way, while you do all this work, be sure to support the tail of the airplane properly. Last thing you want to do is for the tail to fall on the ground and damage your airplane because you don't have the weight of an engine up front. So anytime you remove the engine temporarily or you hang the engine but you want to take a bolt out because you want to put another washer in, always think about that the engine, the airplane can fall on its tail if the engine weight is not up front. Just uh, something to be cautious about. Once that's down, you can start routing things that are piled on top of the engine with tie wraps when it's being shipped, such as the loom or the wires that run your engine that go into the airframe and gonna be plugged into the ECU or the computer that operates the engine. <clears throat> we also have a few hoses to hook up. Now, you wanna make a fairly large cutout in the firewall and then you can always block it with a plate later on Viking is in the process now of having pass-throughs made out of a high temperature nylon, and which will do exactly that. There'll be a clamshell design. This is an earlier design that we use, and it works also. We're gonna do a similar one, but it'll be a little bit larger, so it's easy to get the um, cables in and out through here. So stand by for that. Once your cables are through for the engine, 
eventually you're going to have cables or wires going through for your engine monitor and things like that. Coming inside the airplane, I'm going to show a little bit later, you're going to then support the ECU and plug the connectors into it. And then you're going to look at all the labels on the individual wires and they're going to be terminated in different places. But one step at a time, cut a hole in the firewall adequately sized and then get your ECU bundled through the firewall. Be very careful not to chafe against the sharp edges of the firewall. The sequence of these, of what we're doing here is not super critical, but it lends itself now to hooking up the rest of the things that make the engine run. So you got the wire bundle through the firewall now. If you want a single throttle, you just install that in your panel. Uh, there are different kinds available. Viking also has a bracket that goes underneath here, which is kind of nice if you want to do a fold down panel or if you don't want to push the whole cable through every time because you can on those brackets, you can disconnect the, the throttle if you want to. Builder here elected to just put them in the corner of the panel and that worked out fine as well. And then you route it through the firewall. You can use little plastic grommets if you want or nylon grommets and you just split them quarter inch and, and split them and then you drill a hole for it and pop it around the cable and then push it through. But it does have to be a split design. They also make fancy ones. The eyeball is something that, it, you know, it, it just costs a lot of money for nothing in my opinion, but uh, they do make fancy pass-throughs for throttle cables. Now, this has dual throttles. So that gets a little bit more complicated. You can see it here with a clip on each side. Uh, basically, the, one of the more important things on this installation with the throttle is, number one, use the proper, proper throttle cable. So uh, we have those here. Spruce also has them. Uh, but if you use this cable that comes with your firewall forward, everything is gonna fit. There'll be a dimple in here. There'll be a groove in the cable that the dimple goes into, super critical because you never want that to come loose and be able to move because you have no throttle control in the airplane. On this installation, it seemed to work fine with the aft bolt holes out of the three choices. And then we hooked it up to the ball joint up front here. And that moves, that makes it, you're able to move the whole assembly. Now, of course, with the dual, we have a pilot operated and a co-pilot operated. The one on the other side, we remove the friction lock because we don't want the, the co-pilot to somehow be able to rotate this knob and lock us out of our throttle. So if you take this all the way out, there's a little friction lock gizmo in here. It's a little V-shaped piece of, uh, of, of the Teflon right, right here. So you leave that in on the pilot side, but you remove it on the other side. And of course that's, there's another throttle cable too by McFarlane. We haven't tested it, but that's something new up and coming that we're kind of excited about because it allows you to twist to make fine adjustments on your idle when it's cold and when you just start the engine and everything, but it doesn't have that, that big button that you have to push. So that's something that we're looking into for the near future. So now you can watch the cables out here move your throttle. And in this case, a dual throttle. And you can see how the dual throttle works. There's a piece out of stainless steel that's threaded with two 1032 holes. And the second cable is screwed into it and then jam nutted. And it's just on the back side of the original. Now, if you look at this assembly, another little piece of hint or a little hint here is there's a washer in between the clip and the aluminum there and that's just so that when you torque it all down you don't mangle this clip you don't bend it as you can see there's a washer right there and it gives you just enough pressure to securely lock it in uh, with that little groove the other thing that you'll see here is the uh, idle if I move the throttle there's full power and there's idle. So now this part of it 
is the idle arm and it goes down against this little screw here and that's where you're going to adjust your idle so set your idle once you get the engine up and running and it's at operating temperature and you got the pitch that you want on the propeller and all said and done <clears throat> then set the idle to uh, 1300 rpm now it's going to fluctuate a little bit from there when the engine's cold you start it up it'll be a little lower when you engage the alternator it'll be a bit lower because those are loads on the engine so you'd have to compensate for that hence that McFarland throttle might be very nice and that's something that we're looking forward to testing because we can then make fine adjustments to the idle while the engine's warm warming up and then we can set our 1300 rpm uh, min minimum uh, idle here once the engine is warm with the alternator engaged so that's the throttle installation and we're going to jump into the next part of the installation we have two firewall mounted overflow bottles one is for coolant expand it's not really an expansion bottle it's actually an overflow bottle we're using a system on the 150 where we don't have any pressure we've we've been a little back and forth on that up through the years we use a little bit of pressure like a four pound cap we run no pressure in the 110 engines we ran a little bit of pressure in the 130 uh, we've tested both on the turbo engine and on the 150 the consensus from customers is if we cannot if we can eliminate pressure <clears throat> completely let's do it so again we tried to run no pressure and it is working well during the testing that we've done so far um, the only thing is you, you just have to have very little coolant in the overflow bottle due to its size when the engine is finalized and you have the right cooling system um, or bleeding done if you leave a lot of coolant then it might just blow overboard and you get a little bit on your windshield but it is doable and it does work nice and obviously having no pressure in the cooling system is nice for an airplane engine. The other bottle here is for the uh, gearbox. The gearbox venting bottle is not supposed to really have any oil in it. It's not a gearbox reservoir by any means. Uh, it's only uh, when the gearbox heats up because it has gear oil in it and shrinks by cooling down, oil inside the gearbox wants to also expand and the pressure wants to go somewhere where the air is actually expanding and with that a little bit of misty oil could come out and you don't want that venting onto your airplane so we put a fitting on the back of the gearbox and we run a uh, hose up to this bottle these bottles by the way by the way have vented caps so if you wonder like wow how is it vent if it has a cap it doesn't look like it has a hole in it or anything but what it does is it has a little hole in the rubber membrane in here and because of the threads being as big as they are it then vents down through the the type of thread that they put on the bottle so that's the the actual venting part of it you don't want to tighten these too much just uh, screw them down and then snug it just a little bit i'm having a hard time here because i'm using my left hand and trying to make a video. In any case, we'll get to that after the video. Um, you don't want to run too skinny of a hose. We tried eighth inch inside diameter and it's a little bit harder for it to vent without pushing oil out. So you want a minimum of 3 16 inside diameter hose going down to your gearbox. Now, let's go over and take a look at how the coolant bottle is hooked up. We have our thermostat housing up front here and we just put a fitting in it and we ran the hose parallel to some other cooling hoses that we have and right to the bottle and it works the same way. So initially you want quite a bit of coolant in there and uh, we'll talk about how to fill the cooling system and how to bleed it towards the end of this video when we get more towards running. So mount the two bottles. We ended up just doing through bolts through the firewall. Um, nut plates are nice, obviously, if you ever want to remove them. All 
All right, let's talk about your engine monitor. Whatever engine monitor you have, keep in mind that the, the right question is not like, because uh, we get it a lot, does the Dynon work with the Viking engine? Does the Garmin uh, interface or work with the, with the Viking engine? Does the MGL, does my iPad, do they work with the Viking engine? That's, that's not really how it goes um, because the engine has, every engine monitor has its own sensors. So if you get a Dynon screen, you're gonna get Dynon sensors that screw into the engine and you're gonna run wires from those to your Dynon. If you get a Garmin instrument, you're gonna get Garmin sensors and you screw those into the engine. So what we're gonna cover here is where do those sensors go and what are they? Now, there's some neat features here as far as routing wires. You know, you can pop this little cover off if you want. You wanna be careful that you don't overwhelm the, the passageway for the wires because primarily they are for the running of the engine and that's gonna always be a priority. But once you get your sensor screwed into the engine, you can run your wires through there. Here's our oil pressure transducer. So it is just forward of the exhaust. It's far enough away and the air is coming in from the front that there's no real need to shield it <clears throat> from any kind of heat on that side. Uh, screw that in, it's an eighth inch NPT. Obviously use your Teflon um, sealer and screw that into the engine so, and then uh, go semi-tight on everything. Don't over crank anything and then come back during your inspections to see if you have leaks. Right above that is your coolant temperature. As you can see, we elected to screw the coolant temperature into the exhaust cooling passage, which means that what you're seeing is the absolute hottest that the engine will get. Right in front of that, we have a gearbox temperature probe, and they're all eighth inch NPT or national pipe thread, and they screw in there and then you group these three sets of wires for the gearbox temperature, the coolant temperature, and the oil pressure together. And you can run them through this cover and then run them over and just blend it in with the rest of the things that go in through the firewall and go up to your engine monitor and follow the instructions for your engine mon monitor. If you have a Viking view, there are uh, videos of how to do the Viking view, which is another engine monitor that we sell. In addition to those three sensors you saw up front, in the back of the airplane where the fuel system is located, you're gonna have another transducer. You wanna make sure that's grounded. So as you can see here, it's screwed into a metal assembly, which is then bolted to the airplane. So it has its own ground. But if by chance it's kind of hanging in the hoses or you're supporting it by the hoses somehow, which I wouldn't recommend anyhow, but then there wouldn't be any ground and it wouldn't work. So you have to make sure that that is grounded. Some of these transducers are dual wire or even three wires. So then that's not an issue. So together you have four sensors and here's the fourth one and that's fuel pressure and it's in the back. Now quickly back to the throttle cables, what we did on this airplane, which would be a pretty standard is we ran a three foot cable to the pilot side. So if you're only having one cable, you're gonna end up with a three foot cable for the 150 engine. And if you're gonna run two cables, one on each side, a four footer is just shy and you might have to end up, or you will end up with a five footer for the other cable. And then just put a little bit of a, a loop in it behind the instrument panel. Now you're probably gonna need some kind of heater in your airplane. Viking sells a heater. You can get ours or a different heater, but they're all based on uh, fans and a heater core, just like a, in a car. Now, our instructions show to put the, the reason we're covering this right now is because the hoses from the engine is what we're kind of working on now, hooking everything up that comes off of the engine. So, our instructions show to put the heater nipples through the firewall. And the reason we do that is we don't really want to run hoses inside the airplane. So we're, we're running like the hot coolant in the engine compartment only. 
So once the heater is physically mounted inside the airplane, in this case above the rudder pedals, uh, with a single and a dual fan that can turn on the heat, um, that part is done and we're gonna work on the rest of it outside in the engine compartment. Let's go take a look at it. So at the firewall, you have the fittings coming through like we talked about. This was an existing installation. Um, doing it again, we would have we would have raised the heater slightly so we could clear these fins here or these stiffeners because it ended up needing quite a bit of 90 degree turns to make it organized. Also, if your batteries are not down here, but they're inside the plane on the shelf, or if the batteries are slightly lower, the heater could be down here. But we worked with what we had, and it turned out nice. And we got a, a heater hose going in and a heater hose coming out. Now, which one is in or out doesn't make any difference. You just need hot coolant flowing through the heater core. Now, up front here on the 150 engine, you have a fitting that will be plugged when you receive it. And you can take the plug out and screw a nipple in there, a quarter NPT with a 3H barb, and hook up your 3H fuel injection hose, which is what we use, even for the heater. Uh, the only a, a difference being that it's 3 8 rather than 5 16 for the heater. And then we run right to the heater using proper crimp clamps everywhere. So we'll never have an issue with the possibility of a leak or a failure. And then the other hose, that was actually the hot side. As you can see, it's coming out um, where the coolant has gone through the exhaust and the cylinder head, and that's always the hot side. And then the return is going to be on all of these engines at the inlet side of the coolant pump, which is what draws the cool air or the cool coolant back in and pumps it around in the engine again. And that's in this location. And we have the exhaust, we have a heat shield, alternator and all that. So there's a couple of things in the way, but your engine will come with a fitting down in here. <clears throat> and you can just unbolt the heat shield if you need more room. Uh, this one has a single piece fitting, which means uh, a little bit harder to turn that. So your engine will come with a two piece system where you can get in here with a socket, uh, a long extended socket and just uh, turn, remove the plug if you don't use a heater, the way the engine's shipped, and then screw your fitting in there and then hook up your hose and route it up to the heater. And that's all there's to it. So it's a very simple heating system and it gives you plenty of heat for the airplane. So the engine has to be fed certain things, it has to have voltage, we're gonna look at the cables for that, it has to have air, and it has to have fuel. Now we're gonna talk about the fuel system in the back in great length, but since we're up, up at the engine here, let's take a look at what happens at this end, and it's very simple. You're going to have a quick disconnect right here. And the way these work is you squeeze these little tabs, top and bottom, and then you can pull it out. Now to put it back on, you lubricate it with some Vaseline or what we call O-ring grease, and then you snap it back on. There's O-rings in here, so you don't want to put them on dry, especially when it's got fuel on it, because that kind of dries things a little bit more. And <clears throat> of course, uh, if you've watched any of our other videos, everything we do has the proper or Ediker clamps and the tooling and the hoses and the, all these parts obviously are in your firewall forward kit. And then we just route it forward. We put on a, a Dell clamp here and then we come down along here, put another clamp there, make it look nice. And then underneath the manifold, make sure it's not touching any sharp edges and we put some loom on. And we use the, what's called gray stripe loom. That's the high temperature nylon. Um, so that's what you want to use in the engine compartment, not the stuff that doesn't have a gray stripe on it. And then once we pass through there, the hose comes back out here behind the starter. And we just use some existing bolts, put some clamps, keep the loom on there, run it back, make sure it's not touching anything. And then we run it carefully down here into the center underneath the airplane 
and then we have a channel that runs all the way back. All the Zenit airplanes have two little ridges that come down and we put a, a bottom to it with nut plates so we can have a complete channel. And we run the hose in there, again, clamp it every so often. And as it goes in there, this, this will be the area where we wanna make sure that when the steering rods are going back and forth and everything is working as far as the steerable nose wheel on the Zenit, the hose is not being pinched. So that's what we're gonna watch out for. But other than that, it's very simple. Make sure it stays clear of everything and uh, use the proper clamps, the fuel injection hose and all that. And um, it'll be very safe. The rest of it, as far as what happens to it as it goes back into the rear of the airplane, we're gonna cover in a little bit here. I mentioned that we need fuel, we need air, and we need a few other things to keep an engine running and we need to do it safely. Now, a simple induction system is important, and we, I think we have achieved that with the 150 engine. Basically, uh, get your K&N filter from uh, Viking and install it on the throttle body and clamp it down, and that's it. You can wash and oil it every two, three years with the K&N servicing kit. But the other thing is about a, with an airplane compared to a dirt bike or a car, you, you're not seeing any real dirt. So uh, my opinion is the air, air filter is good for the life of the engine. Just put it on and, and leave it. Obviously inspect it yearly that it's in good shape. But other than that, we were considering adding... Uh, inlet duct on the side of the cowling to get cold air to the air cleaner. But once we put the cowling on and we viewed the inlet to the radiator in the cowling, and we'll take a look at that when the cowling's on, we noticed that not only is there's plenty of air coming in, but there's a pretty clear passage on this side of the engine to the air filter and it is not on the side of the engine that has the hot exhaust, so we're not picking up any heat by the time it passes by the plastic intake manifold and gets to the air filter. So for now, we're gonna leave it just like that. Now, we're gonna run a positive cable to the starter. Everything is extremely easy to get to on this engine, except the starter cable It's a little bit hidden but you can get to it through underneath the intake manifold from the back. But as you can see, there it is with the orange booth on it. So that's where we're gonna hook it up to the top of the starter. Take the nut off and check the, before you get involved, if it's a 12 or a 13 millimeter nut. It can be either one, depending on if it's a, an original Honda nut or a uh, commercial nut. Also, right next to it, right here, you can see the clip for the wire that comes from the ECU loom that engages the starter. So that also needs to be from the ECU loom, you clip that on. Uh, obviously, it's already engaged from Viking, but just make sure that it's, it's on there. And then you'll find the other end of that wire inside the airplane with your ECU wire loom. The big cable, however, number six, is uh, something that you have to attach because it comes from your batteries or from the output side of the batteries at the end of the contactors behind, uh, after it goes through the contactors. Now, once it's attached to the starter up underneath here, you're gonna route it with loom because it's, you know, it has a lot of current, a lot of power in it when the starter is engaged or the contactors are engaged. And then we routed it down along this engine mount bracket in our installation because it just was kind of handy to come down this way. And then we ended up on the back engine mount tube and we went across there and then we came up to our batteries on the other side because the batteries were on the firewall. If, we, if that wasn't the case, if we wanted to come through and do the batteries inside type of installation, then we might run this starter cable uh, up through 
the uh, intake manifold here, we have some other wires, like right in the center of the intake manifold, there's a passageway through here, and we could then run the cable with the other cables into the airplane. Now let's take, it the gr let's take a look at the grounding, because that was the positive side. Of course, before we jump onto that, uh, let's also look at the alternator, because the alternator also just gets hooked up to basically to the starter wire because as your as the alternator is providing a charge we need to get that onto the same cable as the main cable that goes through the starter and so we would run it from the alternator and then to the output side of the contactors let's cover that a little bit more in a second here now obviously your ground straps are important and that's why there's dual <clears throat> we have uh, one from each negative post of the battery and then also at each negative post we have wires going to the um, uh, grounding bus of the airplane but um, here we got grounding strap from one battery grounding strap from the other battery now these are structural bolts they hold the rear engine mount. They're also very convenient, so we decided to use them for this purpose. <clears throat> so you obviously only use the top nut and lock washer. The bottom always stays put because if both of those bolts were removed, guess what? The whole engine would just fall on its nose. Uh, so those bolts are in shear and they're structural but they have enough threads that we can use them for the grounding straps. Let's take a look on the other side. Again, grounding straps are attached. Uh, batteries are on the firewall of this airplane. So one grounding strap goes to the negative terminal there and one goes to the negative terminal of the other battery. And then we have number eight wires or cables running from each terminal as well coming over here and they're providing they just go into the grounding bus we always put the grounding bus inside the plane the, this builder put it on the firewall all right remember we said that the cool side of the cooling system is where the coolant pump is usually referred to as a water pump on a car, but since we're not running any water, we run NPG waterless coolant, it becomes a coolant pump. So here's where the coolant enters the engine through this hose. And then here's where it exits the radiator after it's been cooled. And then on the other side over there, we're gonna go and look, it's where it enters the uh, radiator. So let's look at this side first. First thing we've got is we have these adapters for the radiator, which you can look, uh, you see these uh, nylon filled high temperature adapters right here. There's a little wire here, which you can pop out and then the whole adapter will pull straight up and you can actually disconnect the radiator hose very quickly like that. And it's kind of like those fuel, quick disconnect fuel fittings and you would then lubricate it with uh, O-ring grease and then you can pop it back on. So that's a quick way to disconnect it. Um, right above it, on the other hand, we have a Oedeker clamp, but this is slightly different than what you see that we crimp. These are the type with a screw, so you can reuse them. And in fact, they have little notches here. When they're open, you can adjust the size of the clamp a little bit before you install it. So you would start with a 90 degree elbow right there and you would then clear the engine mounting tube and head forward, use a Oetica clamp there that you would crimp. I usually leave all the clamps a little bit loose until I'm done and I've fitted the whole way. And then I double check everything as far as did I crimp everything? So then you're gonna have your 90 degree aluminum elbow, then another uh, 90 degree hose, 
and as you can see a little bit tight there but the uh, attachment screw can be easily accessed from down here with your screwdriver and here's a little unique item this block that you're seeing back in here this block sits in the engine or in the coolant pump with two o-rings and it's designed to be somewhat free floating it will move a little bit as you can see and but we do have to keep it from coming out of there in the car there's a tube between this location behind the exhaust and it goes up to an area up in here that's all been removed and simplified and we have the hot side and the cool side and are two separate machine pieces. So the piece is stuck in there. It has a little uh, retaining ring right here on one side, as you can see right in there. And that keeps it from going too far in because you don't want it to hit the impeller of the pump. And then it has a notch right here in the aluminum engine mounting bracket. And that holds it so it can't come back out. And it gives it that little bit of a free floating uh, mounting, which it needs so that the two O-rings can self-center in the bore and keep it from leaking. So that's just how your engine is designed as far as that piece going in there. So that is the cold side. Cool just going into the engine in that location. Let's go and look at the hot side. All right, so the hot side is actually on the same side of the engine, but then it crosses over towards the back. So we're coming out of the engine at the thermostat housing. The thermostat sits right inside here. And again, we're using a screw type clamp at each end of the assembly so that if we wanted to remove it, we could. We do it, we do it on a 90 degree uh, turn right there and in this case, we have another screw clamp. And the reason for that is so that we can loosen this particular hose, pull it off of there, rotate it up so this points straight up in the air, and we can fill coolant in it for the first time when, we've, when we put coolant in the engine. And then we, when everything is full, we can rotate it back on, stick it back on the engine and tighten everything down. And after that, we're not gonna fill it here. That's just to get most of the coolant in. Then we have a piece of aluminum tubing running parallel with the top of the engine. A little piece of uh, hose put on here just to protect it as it passes by the exhaust, but the tube actually runs right through that. Uh, as you see these other hoses, they're just kind of tied to the top, and that was the heater we talked about earlier. As we get to the back of the engine, we're making another 90 de degree turn, but we're also kind of doing it in a 45, fashion as in we're making a 90 degree turn but we're not coming straight down with it we're leaning so we can cross behind the engine to the other side and we judge the distance of this tube and where we clamp the clamps in order for the tube then to have adequate clearance between the firewall and the pulleys on the engine if the batteries were not here we could have had a little bit more clearance but we have ad adequate clearance, but those are the criteria, and that's what you would be looking for. Now on the other side, we're gonna walk over there and we're gonna take a look at that as a separate little segment here. Okay, so we're on the other side of the engine. So we came across and now we have a 45 and a little piece of straight. And we do that to come straight up to clear the, the steering rods on the Zenit airplane. If you don't have a Zenit, uh, it's very similar, um, and, but you just would adjust according to what room you have. Um, again, we have a screw clamp there for disconnecting, but also like I was saying on the other side, this adapter can, can do the same thing. Uh, here is one of those adapters. As you see, it has an O-ring in there. You would lubricate that. And uh, then uh, I have this pulled out now, this little clip. So there are no wires in here. There's nothing holding it. There's also two indexing grooves here. So you'd have to rotate it until they line up the proper way. And then it would snap down. Now to put it on, this can actually be left in like that. And you can just uh, index it 
it'll it might feel like it's fitting either way but one indexing groove is deeper than the other so you'd have to play with it if it doesn't go all the way down you have to rotate it all the way around and do it again and then it snaps in to get it back off take a screwdriver in this groove and just pry that and pull those pins out of the way and the whole thing will come off and uh, of course coolant will go everywhere uh, but you can put a big tub underneath there i like to drain the coolant by pulling a smaller hose and just kind of drain it out a little bit at a time your engine will be shipped with an exhaust either mounted or in a box it will not come with two dogs part of your system is going to be the breather from the crankcase we did install some clamps on here if you're having issues with cowling clearance uh, there is a tight fit here and there's no pressure so you probably could leave the clamps off we do have clamps and we'll probably ship them with clamps but <clears throat> that's something to keep in mind the breather hose just kind of goes around here and through a clamp and we have a, a cotter pin right through the hose and that's to hold the hose an eighth of an inch from the exhaust so any fumes that might come out of the engine will blow onto the exhaust and evaporate there is a uh, an all metal gasket behind here and then these bolts are torqued to 220 inch pounds there's four of those there's a shield on the exhaust that help guide the hot air or convection of heat from the alternator and this hose at the bottom is a kind of a vibration dampening system for the gear for the uh, muffler so it doesn't set up a resonance when the prop hits the exhaust pipe and we have a clamp around here and a spring attached to uh, a bolt over here on the engine mount and that's really all there is to the exhaust system now installing the radio okay all right okay we love you uh, installing the radiator get it from the box and look at what you've got in there you've got a radiator and then you have the shroud uh, left and a right and one on the back and then go to our installation page and take a look at the actual installation of those parts because that's universal for all engines and there's a detailed video about how to install the radiator on your airplane. Now let's look at the hoses and how to hook that up.